So a quick introduction for myself. I'm Burr Sutter. I'm normally the host of this series, but I, my day job is actually as a product manager, specifically responsible for JBoss Tools or JBoss Developer Studio, which is one of our most popular technologies we have at JBoss. We have tens of thousands of daily users of JBoss Tools and JBoss Developer Studio. We also have uh, the Seam framework technology. Basically, Seam was born to create CDI and make EE6 happen, and so you actually will see a lot of that actually as part of the EE6 specification. Uh, Snowdrop is specifically the JBoss Spring integration, so if you want some, uh, to in some additional integration capability for using Spring on the JBoss platform, that's the Snowdrop project. Obviously, Spring just runs well on JBoss in general. We do a complete certification of Spring on JBoss to make sure Spring-based applications can run here. But Snowdrop does help you with some additional deployer capability uh, to make some of the magic a little bit easier. Rich Faces is our JSF AJAX uh, library. So if you're interested in specific controls that go beyond the base JSF components, yeah, the Rich Faces library is something you should be very interested in. And I encourage you to check out that project. And Jay and Wes, who um, have worked on that project extensively over the last several years, are here with us today. Our Killian is our integration testing framework. So if you're interested in actually testing in container, being able to exercise that application in a fully scripted way, just like you would JUnit or TestNG in a unit test, but in this case, we're extending test unit, uh, sorry, test in G and JUnit to actually perform an integration test in container, bootstrapping the application, wrapping it up nicely, and then deploying it, testing it, and then ripping it all back down again. So it's an incredibly nice solution for people who really want to work within the context of their application server and test their application. Uh, the last one here I'll mention quickly is Forge, and that's a rapid application development framework. I'd encourage you guys to check that out as well. Lincoln Baxter is our fellow on that particular project. And it's a really nice tool for actually rendering an application quickly. So if you want to get off the ground quickly, you'll be very interested in Forge. Uh, one other item that should be very noted, though, is TorqueBox. If you have a friend or someone in the family that does Ruby on Rails, and you'd like to run that Ruby on Rails application in a JVM with all the capabilities of the application server, including messaging, asynchronous tasks, um, taking advantage of whatever Java EE feature you're used to, whether it be clustering and other technologies for load balancing, etc., but you want that for the Ruby on Rails world, well then TorqueBox is the project you should look at. So we'll keep moving along. One thing to note here is my email addresses. Feel free to send me emails or tweet me at Burr Sutter if you're on Twitter. So let's show you a demo. So we've done enough talking so far. I want to kick things off with a demo, and this is where we get a little bit crazy. I'm going to actually, I have a virtual machine running here. Let's see if this thing looks pretty good. This is actually the keynote demonstration we did at JBoss World this past year. I'm just refreshing everything, see if everything's happy. And the reason this is um, interesting, and especially interesting today around HTML5 and mobile technology, we wanted to make the point that we have a number of ways at JBoss to enable a mobile-based application. This, this first application here is actually HTML5 Canvas, and it actually is all rendered in JavaScript. And we use the JavaScript to actually create this floating ball image. And so there's one ball right now. But the idea behind this uh, specific ball is it represents a node and a cluster. And not really an application server cluster the way you think of it, but a node in the data grid cluster. So this is actually a node representing InfiniSpan. And what I'm going to do is start up some other InfiniSpans here in the background. So I'm basically running like a whole data center here in this virtual machine. We're, we're running what would normally be multiple servers. Get them all started there. You can kind of see the, the painting on the screen. They pop in. It animates nicely. It has a gravitational effect. And then once it creates the orbit, if you will, it then kind of circles in nicely. And all that's done in a typical HTML5 kind of architecture. So this is an HTML5 technology running within the Chrome browser. If I hit my refresh here, you can see it repaints nicely. OK, we're not done with that yet, but I'll show you a couple other things here. This screen is actually a JSF Rich Faces screen. So this is JSF2, Rich Faces 4. This was actually created by Wes and Jay specifically for this demonstration. What this will show is actually a listing of the various tweets that come in. So what we're going to do with this data grid is we're going to hold all the tweets in the data grid. We're going to display them in the actual uh, Rich Faces application here. And we're also going to use a Google Web Toolkit application uh, to demonstrate uh, some capabilities. So we're, we're going to do real-time push to the Google Web Toolkit application through a technology called Arai. And this is going to build a little tag cloud. It's going to identify the, the key hashtags that are uh, the most frequent. So let's go ahead and get started here. All right, so there's our first set of tweets coming in. And I can't 
uh, I actually should warn you for the audience members, I, we're not filtering this. So who knows what comes in based on what people are tweeting out there. So you can see the tag cloud is populating. You can see the tweet stream demo here is, is populating, telling us what the most um, common uh, hashtags are and who the top tweeters are, and this is filling up. And then what's also is interesting is our data grid is filling up. So you can see that we have five nodes in our data grid, and we've animated them such that as they take on more data, they keep adding these little balls. So the innermost set is, of balls represents 1 through 10, then the next one is 10 through 100, and this last set is actually um, 100 through 1,000. Uh, so we're actually adding many hundreds of tweets into the data grid, and it's broadcasting those out across the cluster. So this concept, uh, this by the way, all these things run on a mobile browser. I'm not running in a mobile browser right now. I'm running it on this nice Chrome browser. But you can see that we're pushing the data out, and we can see that Troy Davis, or you know, uh, you know, these various things are trending. Team Followback is always a fo um, popular one, I've noticed, as we run this demo. But you can kind of see what's going on here. Okay, so we have the tweets moving in. Let me go ahead and stop that, and let me show you one other thing. Let's go ahead and kill one of these nodes in the data grid. All right, so we dropped it, and you can see it lose, it drops out of the screen here. Let's kill another one. Okay, and what's neat about that is our, our tweet stream demo continues working. Our, our Google Web Toolkit screen here continues working. And we now have two, two items, or three items, so we can actually uh, kill another one of those. How about that? All right, so we're back down to just two nodes, and if you notice, that blue one just finished populating based on the fact we killed the others. These guys are now full of all the data, and so everything is redundant, you know, if you have a a problem in server outage, hardware outage, etc. then of course that would take care of it. But I wanted to show you guys these things because this kind of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about in this session. This being an HTML5 based application and these not specifically being HTML5 necessarily, there is some HTML5 capability here, but just a firm understanding for how you build a mobile friendly application and a really interesting push oriented application in this case, you know, really dynamic content. So let's go ahead and minimize that and we'll get back into the presentation. Okay, so our focus on user interface really is uh, across three areas. You can certainly build a user interface with JBoss a number of different ways. You can build struts-based applications, as many of you have, or Spring MVC, as many of you have, and even using Adobe Flex, as many of you have. Uh, we've seen all of those out there in production with our customer base and user base. Uh, but the one we're focused on here today is this thing we call the PO5 architecture. So PO5 is specifically taking an HTML5 client and interacting with the server-side process through REST and JSON primarily. And then you can augment that HTML5 client with something like jQuery Mobile or Sencha Touch or Sprout Core or other JavaScript libraries to give a more a richer desktop experience and a richer uh, client-side mobile experience. And I'll show you some examples of that. We also have JSF2 and Virtuaces 4, obviously, and Google Web Toolkit is primarily owned by uh, Google. But we do have the Array project, which gives it that push capability you saw in the last demo. So just keep in mind that the three you see up here at the top, the PO5 architecture, JSF2, Rich Faces 4, and GWT are the ones we're primarily investing in uh, and interested in and pushing to our user base right now. So here's an uh, example of Rich Faces. So this is the uh, Rich Faces showcase. Rich Faces 4, by the way, is specifically focused on JSF2 components. And then as far as Google Web Toolkit goes, we actually use it internally for a lot of our own projects. So if you actually go out and look at the Drools Governor project, otherwise known as the JBoss BRMS, or if you've been looking at the new JBPM technology, or if you've downloaded App Server 7 and looked at its admin console, or if you actually heard of our JBoss Operations Network console, otherwise known as RHQ, all of those consoles are being created under Google Web Toolkit now. And so we're moving in that direction for all our uh, GUI applications for Google Web Toolkit. So that's why we mentioned here in the session. But we're really going to focus on this PO5 architecture. All right, the plain old HTML5 plus REST, which basically means I'm going to build a heavier HTML JavaScript application, maybe taking advantage of different uh, uh, JavaScript libraries like uh, jQuery and let's say even Prototype or Dojo, etc. And I'm going to use that to interact with my server in a RESTful way. So this is not having a server-side architecture that generates HTML, like JSF, or even something like Struts or Tapestry or Wicked. It's really having a server-side architecture focused on the server, RESTful endpoints, maybe EJBs, and certainly JPA components and domain objects, and a client-side architecture that's very much focused on the client. This is client-server all over again. And I know some of you guys are probably rolling your eyes in your head right now saying, oh, no, I didn't want to go back 15 years to client-server. 
But there is a reason why the client server architecture was successful in the mid 90s and certainly did very well. And, and there's certainly a reason why the web has been very successful in the last couple of years, and we're going to take advantage of those uh, successes. So what is HTML5? So really, HTML5 is nothing more than the current specifications going forward uh, for HTML, cascading style sheets, and JavaScript. So uh, there's a group out there for W3C. Obviously, W3C is the standards body that's putting all this together. But there's also the what, uh, what Working Group, who has also been a key catalyst in making the standard happen. And so one thing to note that HTML5 is a collection of standards. It's actually not a single standard. And there's a lot going into it. So there's a ton of stuff to actually talk about here. But people have forgotten there was an HTML4, and there was an HTML3, uh, and there were books on that. It's just that it's been a long time since we looked at HTML. So for some of us, we're kind of going back 10, 15 years to think about HTML for, uh, that we haven't thought about for several years now. So why is this all the hype now? Mostly because of Chrome. right? So I'm going to give a lot of credit to the Chrome browser. When it happened, it exploded onto the market. It showed us a different way to build web-based applications. So you could do so much more with the Chrome browser than you could do with previous incarnations of the browser. Uh, the other aspect has been the What Working Group, so the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. Those guys specifically worked on building a standard from reality. They actually looked at a number of websites that were out there, identified what people were currently using and common, uh, common ways that various browsers had extended the HTML specification and style sheets and JavaScript, etc. And they had looked at those extensions and then found ways that people should be using those uh, and, and of course, aggregating, aggregating that to a standard. There's also this concept here of the iPhone. The iPhone has exploded onto the scene, and now we really want to build mobile web-friendly applications. And there's no Flash available on the iPhone, as everyone knows, and so we had to find a new way to give dynamic, rich content to, let's say, an iPhone or iPad or iOS device. So smartphones started out shipping desktops in Q4 of 2010. So for most of us who've been in the web development game for a while, we now recognize we have to support those additional smartphones as equal citizens to our applications. And there's tens of millions of tablets being sold all the time. And one thing I think is very critical is that Internet Explorer is fading fast. It no longer controls 90% of the market. And primarily, I'd give Firefox the credit for that. They were able to uh, really take a bite out of the uh, Internet Explorer movement. And then, of course, Chrome has kind of been the one who's finishing it off, I would say. And all of us developers are now ready to do something new. I think that's also another key reason why HTML5 that has so much hype right now, as evidenced by the number of people who have joined us today. So a uh, quick look of, at browser statistics. Obviously, your mileage will vary. Your statistics will vary. I'd encourage you to look at your website statistics and your web application statistics and see what your user base looks like. But just to provide some evidence here, just in the last few months, you can see Chrome, in the case of the uh, W3Schools uh, listing, has grown from 23% in January up to 30% in August. And this is a browser that's only been in existence a little bit of time. So already Chrome is taking a 30% market share uh, uh, when, when it was dominated by IE and Firefox before that now. If you, all, if you look at the W3 Counter one over here, you can see that uh, Chrome 13, just in September, has bumped up dramatically to 16%. And I think that's important here. One thing that's different about today versus yesterday is you would have to wait, in the case of IE, for a whole operating system upgrade to get the next version of Internet Explorer. In the case of Chrome and Firefox, people are upgrading automatically in real time. So they can take advantage of new features available to them through the HTML5 specification or even just vendor-specific extensions immediately. And I think that's a key catalyst to why this is changing so rapidly. So Chrome 13 is just out recently, and now even in this group of people here, 16% uh, are starting to use it already. And then one thing to note is you do have to factor in how many people are still using IE in your application, uh, in your website. In this case, we use jboss.org as an example. You can see that um, Chrome was at 25% back in February, March, and is at 31% here uh, in August to September. You can see Firefox is still the dominant browser for us, but IE is still has still has a 18% here. So Internet Explorer is 18%. And so I asked the team to break that down for me, and Mark Newton was kind enough to give me these results. We can see that IE8 had 75,000 visitors, IE9, 22,000, but IE6 had 12,000 visitors. So it's actually a pretty small number. And so if we wanted to actually push more IE6 users to upgrade, we probably could. It's a relatively small number. 
So at a high level, I broke down the HTML5 capabilities into two major sections, one for designers and one for developers, because I'm a Java web developer. I like to think in those terms. So I wanted to break down all of this stuff, and there's so much going on in HTML5. I wanted to basically say, here's what's interesting when I'm kind of in designing mode, and here's what's interesting when I'm in programming mode, if that makes sense, when I have to build an application versus, you know, I'm interested in just knocking out a really cool website. So at the highest level, there's some new tags that have been introduced, like article, header, footer, nav, and a side. I'll show you a, I'll show you a diagram on that in a second. But that does give you more semantic meaning to your page. You no longer have to have div tags uh, specifically trying to say, this is the navigation div, this is the uh, header div, the footer div. And if people spell those things differently, of course, um, or name them differently throughout their various pages, then it's actually harder to know the meaning of those components within a page. So the idea of having specific header, footer, navigation means even things like um, uh, browser uh, readers or specifically things that read them out verbally. So for people who, are, who have a, a visual impairment, you know, it can look at the nav tag and specifically say, this is the navigation for this page is one example. Also, if you're into inter design, if you're the Photoshop kind of person, then all this new stuff has happened around the hue and saturation, luminance, uh, opacity. You can change the opacity of a specific component, fade it into the background, make it stand out more. You can shadow it. Uh, there's all kinds of great stuff that's been happening there. But I really consider that more for the Photoshop person who really is into all that sort of thing. Me, I make ugly websites and ugly applications. I don't normally mess with those capabilities. And if you look at font faces out there too, so you can actually declare your own fonts as a true type font or open type font and have it load directly into the browser and down to the user. And so you can have a crazy you know, pirate font if that's what you wanted and provide it out to your user base. Uh, one of the biggest things that people are excited about are the border radius. You can have rounded corners now on your components, like if you have uh, rectangles or whatever that you've declared out there, you can actually make uh, nice rounded borders of them. Uh, transforms and transitions are very interesting. That's the idea where things slide off and slide in. Think your PowerPoint transitions and you'll have the right idea. So that's been standardized now in HTML5. Uh, there's a, a link there that provides more information. And our, one of our people here in the session today, Wesley Hales, has done a lot of research at the transforms and trans, transitions areas. So we can, you can certainly ask him some questions about that. Uh, Canvas is a big deal. When you saw the spinning balls, Inside the diagram, uh, inside the first demonstration, that was Canvas in action. So you can actually render whatever you want, fully animate it. Uh, in that case, it looks like a cartoon, and we want it to look that way. But it's completely responsive to our server-side events. So it truly represents something happening on the JBoss infrastructure back there. And we use Canvas for that. So Canvas might be your tool where you would actually render business charts and business graphics and actually try to drive real-time data out of those business charts. Uh, video and audio have been a big win. Certainly YouTube is driven the video concept and other video um, services have certainly provided different video options for HTML5, working better on a mobile browser, etc. Drag and drop is also part of it and speech input has also been added so you can talk to your browser now. It's pretty interesting and there's a link there. You can go test that uh, at the html5rocks.com if you have the Chrome browser at least. I've not tested it with other browsers but it works pretty neat. So at the highest level here, the, the header, nav, aside, footer, I do see a lot of use for this because if you remember back in the mid 90s, we used to do frame sets. So yeah, I had to think about this for a little bit. It's like, wow, it's been 15 years. I haven't done frame sets in 15 years. Um, but even in the late 90s, we did tables, you know, table row, table header, table, table data. Uh, and that's how we taught people to build web based systems, web based applications back then through CGI and various CGI technologies. This is before Java really started building servlets in many cases. Um, but so frame sets were pretty cool. Kind of, not really, but we used them because we had to. We had to have this layout. And in the uh, 2000s, we had used divs, right? Div tags with a specific ID to say this is the nav, this header to the footer. And now, going forward, we'll actually be able to use real tags that represent those components, which I think is very valuable. So HTML5 Canvas, you saw an example of that earlier. Let me pop out into a demo, though, just to kind of make the point. I was so excited when I saw this particular demo. Why? Because, you know, I, I'm a creature of the 80s, and when you see something like this, you want to kind of bust out your parachute pants and members-only jacket and actually have some fun. And so this is an example of an HTML5 game. It's Canvas, but this is all JavaScript and HTML. There's, this is not uh, specifically anything but Flash in it. And so, unfortunately, this is not a good Space Invaders. You remember, there should, should be three little blocking things there, and it actually lets you shoot too fast. Um, but this is about as good as I am at video games. But I wanted to kind of show you that, playing that game in real time, because that's really what it's about here. 
So that kind of capability is now available to you. And of course, there's a Pac-Man out there, and there's even a multiplayer Doom version that the Google folks have showed. So another example of Canvas, uh, again, in that demo, you saw that. Um, and then this one actually I did on my iPad. It's a finger painting kind of thing. You can, <laughs> uh, or you can use your mouse and actually do some sketching uh, with an HTML5 Canvas. An HTML5 video, there's uh, all kinds of neat ways to actually work, interact with video. I, I show you a demo of this, but I think you guys can go find these on your own. So video, you can actually interact with through JavaScript and actually programmatically add your own pieces to the video on the fly. And that's what you see here in this lower right-hand corner where I made a B and I added the Firefox logo directly into this fellow's video. Um, as, and, and of course, it rotates based on his hand movement. So this is the Firefox, folks. It's a great demo of what you can do with HTML5 video. Rounded corners are very cool. And so let's talk about programmers. What is it for programmers? And so I've identified these things that I think are particularly important to the programming community, Java programmers in particular. And then we'll kind of drill down on some of these and show you some of this stuff. Uh, WebSockets, I think it's particularly powerful. WebSockets will enable you to do a push kind of capability. And I have a demo of that. We'll get to that in a second. I think you got to see the demo to really get a feel for what WebSockets can do. But just think of a TCP IP connection between the browser and the server. And, you know, I've seen examples of kind of a SSH or Telnet kind of session, a VNC kind of session. People have done all kinds of crazy things with WebSockets. Uh, so we can talk more about that in a second. Web storage is also very important for a lot of uh, the web developer use cases. They want to find ways to support an offline capability. And the local storage gives you one aspect of being able to store data on the client side, on that mobile device, or on the desktop browser. Bear in mind that it's just there on the hard drive. It's not encrypted in any way unless you specifically encrypt it. So you do have to consider that. Uh, beyond local storage, though, is also the Web SQL database. And if you notice, I put the asterisk there. Web SQL database is being deprecated, or it's not being completed. The specification committee has opted to move towards IndexedDB instead. Uh, but funny enough, Web SQL database is out there uh, in a number of different implementations and available to you on Android and iOS. Web workers, for the Java person in you, that's like, that's like um, threading. So you think of that threading concept you've done in Java for the number of years, you know, the ability to put things in the background and run stuff uh, asynchronously from the main thread. Uh, that's the concept of web workers. You can actually basically stage JavaScript uh, execution in the background thread is the easiest way to think of it. And it can do stuff in the background and then alert you to when it's done. So a very powerful capability. For the average business application, I don't know if I found uh, specifically a use case for that yet. I have to think about that one more. But web storage and web sockets are very powerful for the average business application. One thing that's new too in HTML5 are all the new form fields, specifically like email, date, telephone, color, number. So these have some built-in validations to them. And they also can interact with the native device um, uh, keyboards and editors. So let's say that you put in the email tag, specifically an HTML email tag. When the user actually enters that field on an iPhone, it'll switch to the email entry keypad. So you can actually see an at sign down there as an example. Uh, in the case of a number, it'll switch to the number keypad for the user. So that just is a really nice in-user uh, in feature to switch to the right keyboard operation based on what field type they're looking at. Some other uh, options that are interesting are like meter or progress. So that's like the little meter bar, you know, how many, how many per what percentage are we completed yet? Application cache is also pretty interesting. They, I, you can cache my components of the application, my JS files, my HTML files, my style sheets. Put those in the cache on the, on the browser side, the client side. And, and, um, and that, of course, means the next time the user runs the application, things will perform better. There's also the concept of notifications, uh, you know, little pop-ups. Geolocation, so tell me where I'm at right now and show it on a map. And there's kind of a screenshot of that there. Device orientation, you know, am I, am I tilted to the left, tilted to the right? Am I horizontal or portrait? And server-side events, which not too many people are excited about, but I'm still researching that one. The idea that you can do pushes without web sockets, but it, that's not widely implemented, and it's certainly not well supported at this point. So this is just a quick slide to tell you what is supported. This is using Modernizer to detect uh, different desktop browsers. You can see I specifically have done uh, IE, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. And you can kind of see that um, IE 9 still is a little bit behind on several key capabilities like WebSockets, Web Workers, uh, IndexedDB, Application Cache. I think those are the important ones. Uh, I made note of them there. Um, Firefox did well with WebSockets, Web Workers, but WebSockets are disabled by default. In this case, I ran and re-enabled it. So bear that in mind, WebSockets are often disabled by default for some browsers at this time. Uh, but you can see index.db is not supported by Chrome yet. 
nor Safari yet, but WebSQL database is. So if you want to take advantage of that feature, you may have to wait a little while um, before that come, becomes available. It's more interesting when you look at the um, mobile devices, though, like iOS. So iOS uh, has WebSocket support and WebSQL database, but no web workers and no IndexedDB. That's one example, and I actually showed an iPod and an iPad. It's, since it's the same operating system, you get the same capabilities out of it. All right, and Android actually does a little bit, it's not as quite as robust. It doesn't implement as many features. WebSockets is missing for the Android user. Um, and then, of course, SG, SVG, SMIL, some of these other things that are more uh, specifically focused on the design side are missing for the Android user. And that's Android 2.2 and 2.3. And I've also tested Android 3 as well. And this is HTML5Test.com. encourage you to check it out. And you can actually send your users to this website to let them look at this uh, themselves. But they can take their device and you can visit the site. You can try it right now while you're in session. And what's happened here is they've changed their scoring criteria. That's why I show both. So in June, 20, June 21st, it was 206 for the iOS. And now uh, nothing's changed on that device. It's now 210. And in the case of Android, we had a 182, but it, its score was lowered to 177. So somehow or another, the rules have changed, and it looks more favorable to iOS and less for Android. But Android is less capable, and that should be noted. So you have to do some additional tricks to make Android work the way you want it to. All right, so Android versus iOS side by side. You can see IndexedDB Index DB is missing for both, but WebSockets is missing for Android, as well as the SVG stuff, as well as uh, CSS3 transforms. So there are some notable ones that are missing for Android users, WebSockets being the more important one for me because I think that's one of the neater features. But what has happened uh, in the Android world, and I think this quote is interesting, if you're familiar with Ajaxian.com or FunctionSource.com, Dion is a fellow who goes out and gives a lot of presentations around client-side development over the last several years at Java One and DevOps and other places. And this is a great quote from him. Yeah, basically, the Android Web Kit, Kit is the closest thing to being the IE6 of mobile for him. I think that's a funny quote, and I give you a link there. But just know that Android is weaker than, and I actually primarily run an Android phone as my daily phone. So what can you do today? Well, today, you can use something called Modernizer. So we saw that there's a number of gaps, if you will, in HTML5 support on various desktop browsers and various mobile browsers. And you can use Modernizer to detect to see if a feature is there or not, and then, of course, make a different decision based on what the user has uh, available to them. So Modernizer is a great tool, and if you carry one tip away from this presentation, think Modernizer as a tool you could use uh, to verify what capabilities are on that client-side device and make a decision accordingly. Another one that's growing in popularity, and this is for the IE crowd, for Internet Explorer. So Chrome Frame is only for an Internet Explorer, primarily targeting the desktop uh, capability. I've not actually seen anything on the mobile side, but for IE6, IE7, IE8, uh, I think IE9 they support now as well. But one of the things that often comes up when you talk about HTML5 and what all these new capabilities are, people will invariably say, but I've got users with IE6, I've got users with IE7, it doesn't support this. Even IE9 doesn't support all these cool things. Well, Chrome Frame basically puts Chrome inside your IE. And I encourage you to check that one out. Like we've suggested it multiple times, and in my last session, it was a live event, so I had you know, a couple hundred people staring at me, uh, I threw this idea out there, and I said, well, has anyone tried it? And there was actually one gentleman who specifically has deployed an application to multiple hundreds of users in a traditional big big old corporate enterprise here in the US um, and because he had IE6 as a desktop standard and with Chrome Frame they were able to then leverage all the advanced capabilities that Chrome can provide now within that browser session so it was a big success for him and that's one example uh, of, of seeing it live in real time. Now, if you have other examples feel free to send me an email I'd be interested in hearing about your Chrome Frame experience Another thing I really like is jQuery Mobile. I'll show you an example of that here in a moment. But jQuery Mobile is used by Verizon, uh, and I'll, I'll have some demos of it. You'll get to see more of that. Uh, IUI is one that Bank of America has been using, and I think it's pretty interesting also. It, it does do a nice job giving you a nice mobile experience for a mobile web-based application. And Sencha Touch has done very well out there in the marketplace overall as well. But jQuery Mobile, I just throw a screenshot of it coming from my phone uh, up on the screen here. You can get a chance to see it, and we'll show you more. So frameworks have really exploded. We love frameworks. We're developers, right? We love frameworks. We want to build our own or find new ones all the time. So we had all those in the Java web framework world. We had all those in the Ajax world. We've already forgotten about the Ajax world, but it was only five, six years ago. And things like Dojo and Scriptaculous and Prototype were huge. We had to get our heads around those. And now we have mobile 
web JavaScript frameworks. jQuery Mobile, Sentry Touch, Zepto, Joe, even IUI, which is specifically more of an iPhone thing, but it works fine on Android. Um, I think that's interesting how we've seen so much activity in this space. So here's some examples. So we kind of said there's not a lot of HTML5 support in some of these devices. This is my Android phone I took these screenshots from. You can still build a fantastic mobile web experience for your end user with the capabilities that are out there today. A good example of that is Amazon. This is specifically form, the right form factor and the right orientation and the right size and shape, etc., for a nice mobile experience. And it's unique from their desktop experience. Here's Bank of America. Uh, one thing I would note too, if, if you notice, the menuing system looks a lot alike here. You notice the bars, they're big and fat, so you can actually put your finger on them. Here's Best Western, again, the big fat bars, I can put my finger on very easily. You can also download the Best Western app, they advertise their app, native application, and you can also get access to the full website, another design technique you see across all of these nice sites. Here's Verizon, okay, I mentioned, I mentioned Verizon was uh, jQuery Mobile, so I, you can do a view source and go check those things out. And so those are some good examples. Here's another one that we did. I used to be part of the Atlanta Java user group specifically, and we did this big conference every year called DevNexus. It still runs. You'll see a 2012 version. Um, but one gentleman there named Gunner specifically built a nice DevNexus mobile-specific web application. And that's a great example of what you can see out there in a mobile browser. And there are also some bad examples. So I like to make fun of Apple here. So the vendor of the iPhone does not have a great iPhone-based mobile web application. If you go to apple.com on your iPhone or Android phone, this is an Android screenshot, but I also tested it on iPhone as well. You know, you get their regular website, and it's really hard to click on those links. You know, I've got a pretty small finger, but I can't click on those links. Um, and, of course, everything's kind of microscopic. So I think uh, Apple's interesting from this category. They decided not to build a specific mobile web experience. Um, but then I also wanted to test, test someone else. I tried Verizon, so I tried AT&T on my Android device. So here's the company that, in the case of the U.S., delivered iPhone to the masses, and if you go to their site on Android at least, you get a security certificate warning, which I thought was funny. So usability was not a priority uh, for either of those companies on the mobile web yet. So the good news is, for those of you guys who are new to mobile web and interested in HTML5 for the first time, you're not, you're not too late to the game here. You know, Apple hasn't got there yet, AT&T hasn't figured it out completely yet. There's a lot of organizations who really haven't delivered a good mobile web experience for their, their end users. Um, here's an example of where I tried to do one. So I used CSS, right, and tried to really come up with some neat stuff to make these buttons here look like buttons and finger friendly. So for the mobile device. Well, what's weird about that is I spent a lot of time tweaking it, messing around with it, seeing what I could do with it. And I'm not a very good designer. Uh, certainly Jay and Wes are much better than I am than with cus cascading style sheets. But in this case with jQuery Mobile, we're able to simply just put jQuery Mobile in and you get the look and feel for free. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to build a style sheet. You don't have to even write a lot of JavaScript. jQuery Mobile will figure out what it should look like and give you a nice experience. All right, so here's another examples of jQuery Mobile. You can see they have like, you know, different types of icons, toggle boxes, uh, toggle buttons, you know, pop-up controls, sliders and switches. So you get all that uh, out of the box. You just have to simply define your components and it'll style them appropriately and make them look like they belong on an iPhone for you, including like little back buttons and things like that. So I, I've been pretty impressed with jQuery Mobile. There are other options out there, but so far I've been in, enjoying the use of it. So a quick note on Modernizer. Here's how it looks. If Modernizer.local storage, then I have local storage. Else, I don't have local storage. So it's a very simple API to use, and you can then use that to determine what you will do uh, for your end users based on what they have available in the browser they're using at that moment in time. And what Modernizer does not do, all right, is it does not magically enable the properties. If it's not there, it's not there. But there's an, another movement happening in the Modernizer world called polyfills. And the idea is that you can use these polyfills to um, overcome certain aspects that aren't there, and, and in other words, fake uh, canvas. In this case, Flash Canvas, it'll use the Flash plugin to treat it like Canvas. Or in the case of storage, it'll actually, you know, give you storage when there is no storage. It's kind of interesting. I haven't looked at all these options. Wes specifically, uh, Wes Hales was looking at a lot of these options here. Uh, and if you have questions, feel free to ask and we'll see what kind of answers we can give you. So let's show you another, another demo of this jQuery REST easy stuff. For the Java programmer, this is very straightforward. All right, here's a simple example. I'm going to build a RESTful endpoint. It's going to look for the ID 
and it's going to find the hotel. This is the same booking application, but done so that it has REST 1 points and it has a jQuery mobile front end. We'll show you all that in a second. So I'm going to find the hotel. I'm going to return the hotel. So REST is so easy to use. Just a couple simple annotations. Uh, like here's another example. It produces JSON. It responds to the get. Okay. And it's going to return a list of hotels in this case. So we're going to get a list of hotels or the details about one specific hotel. And this is a simple demo, but I'll show you what it looks like at the um, HTML side. Oh, I don't have the HTML side loaded here. Let's see. Here we go. Oh, come on, Eclipse, switch for me. So on the HTML side, it's very straightforward. I basically have a div tag and these ULs and line items. So right here, we're going to inject the rest of the hotels dynamically. But this is jQuery mobile in action. See this data role? All right. Data inset. Data theme. That's their properties to basically how they will style it. So let's show you this thing running. All right. So it's much more fun if you actually see it running. So I'm going to do this. And I'm going to show you actually on the mobile devices. All right. So you can see my little camera here. let that focus and now I can see I can you notice it, it's styled nicely I can scroll up and down if I drill down on a specific one all right it makes another request it makes a restful request and drills down on that specific hotel but the look and feel here is all handled by jQuery the fact that it all runs on my iPad and iPhone I didn't have to think about and it also runs on the Android phone so here's the Android device too same user experience I didn't style it I didn't have to come up with this crazy look and feel jQuery gave me all that for free. All I did was build the RESTful endpoint to, hand, to handle it. And so you can go here and go here. So this is just me running on my three devices. But you guys can also test these yourself. I have actually deployed this application up into OpenShift Express, which is our cloud property, our platform as a service. And one of the reasons I like working with a cloud technology like that is because you guys can all then play with the application as well. So let me pull up the chat panel here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you guys, uh, all participants, all right? You guys want to try this out for yourself? So I made a bit.ly link. I'm going to type it in here. That should be the right one. So I sent that out, out as chat. You have to bring up your chat window so you can see it. But then you guys can also try this for yourself on your mobile device. And feel free to send us comments about uh, or questions about did it work or not work because I've not tested it all that thoroughly but you can see it running here on my little devices alright so that's an example of what jQuery mobile and in this case a simple rest endpoint find the, find the hotel find all hotels will do for you the styling comes from jQuery mobile so I've been very excited about that and that's just a simple demo and again the neat thing is it's all running at the cloud so you guys can play with it as well so uh, it'll be interesting to see how much you guys pound on it there's a, several hundred of you here today very well be you could take down the site with too much activity. It looks like we have started doing that. So uh, OpenShift Express is not meant for hundreds of concurrent users, but it does give me the ability to actually go out there and say, I want to show you some capabilities and test some things. Okay. We'll try this other one here in a second. All right, so that's this demonstration. And the other demo I want to show you and I know I'll move along rather rather fast here, but the other demo I want to show you is this concept of web sockets. And let me see if I can pull that one up, the code here. No. That's the plain stuff here. Yeah, let's look at this one. I have to remember which program I'm in. Is it this one? Okay. So this is an interesting one. This is an example of Canvas. And I have used a technology called Tag Canvas, and it'll paint a little tag cloud. So as I push messages out to it, we can actually interact with it and, and play with it. So let's um, give that a try. So I'm going to pull up so you guys can see what I'm doing here. Let's see if this will work for me. Tag Canvas. Get the iPad awake as well so we can see what's going on there. And it's a little harder to do this with... Um, everything in the way there we go all right and unfortunately the Android actually will have an error because it doesn't support web sockets I have it set up let's get it to refresh and it should give me the error message there we go see 
So Android doesn't support WebSockets, but here's an example why WebSockets can become so important. Let's move that out of the way a little bit. And let me do this. Refresh this page. Let me do a refresh to make sure everything is there's nothing weird cached or anything like that. And now I can send my name. If you watch the mobile guys there, so I'm sending from one browser, in this case Safari on my desktop, out to these mobile devices. It's going out through, in this case, EC2. I have this running out of the EC2, a JBoss server running out there. And you can see that as I put in a message, uh, in this case something simple, it shows up on my mobile devices. So I think that's pretty neat too. Let's let you guys play. All right, so I'm running high-risk demo mode here. I let everybody play. So here's an example of, that we'll probably bring, with this many people on the line, we'll probably bring this thing down too, but hopefully it'll give you an idea and inspire you to think about these things some more. So I think that was number three. The sender is number three. That's how you send messages in. And so what happens is, all right, and then if you want to run the same thing I'm running here, so yeah, I see some of you guys put in some uh, messages right there. I have it limited to 10 pieces of uh, 10 letters, so you won't get a whole message in. Um, but you can see some people are out there right now running in this live session, pushing messages through this channel, through the through a, a mechanism here through Hornet Q. So Hornet Q, of course, is our messaging technology. We've uh, we, what we have here is a, a donation from Jeff Jeff Missel who specifically bridge stomp into WebSockets. So what's cool about that is you can do real-time push out to people's mobile devices. In this case, the little iPhone here, an iPhone 3G or the iPad, and you can see some different people have signed on there to send in some messages. So a simple example, um, but it shows you hopefully the power of what HTML5 can give you. In this case, a WebSocket capability and a um, HTML5 capability using Canvas. This is all painted in Canvas. And let me actually do this. I didn't show you the full capability there. Um, on the desktop, it actually has a fun feature. So here's some messages coming in, but it also we have it, it actually is animated on the desktop, so it'll swoop around. And so if I push more messages in, it's a short timeout on the message sending thing, but if you just push messages in, you can see they swoop around. Okay, but you're in your case, you're interacting on your desktop or your mobile device, seeing these things, the messages go out to you, and we're broadcasting them out to everybody. All right, well, let's, um, well, there's some fun stuff. And, and you guys kept it very clean. I'm proud of you guys. So no, no horrendous messages coming through that channel. <laughs> so I wanted to show you those kind of um, demos to give you a feel for what we can do here. So again, jQuery Mobile give, gives me the look and feel that I need. I can use things like WebSockets to do some really clever capability. But as you saw, it wasn't working on my Android device. It won't work on your Android device because Android doesn't support it. And that's nothing, I, as far as I know, there's no workaround to that problem. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Okay? So I, I rushed through everything so I could then have the opportunity to kind of get some questions and, uh, and, and interact with you guys. So I wanted to show you quickly the different HTML5 capabilities that I thought were interesting out there. Uh, I'd encourage you guys to go to HTML5rocks.com, and you can actually run a whole slideshow there. And I can, let me bring that up real quick. So there's my Space Invaders. But they have a whole slideshow, and if you have to give your own HTML5 presentation inside your company or to your local user group of some sort, you can just use a slide deck. It all runs within Chrome, and you can navigate it with arrow keys, and it works really well. Uh, I chose not to use it, but I've actually been to several presentations where people just use this HTML5 presentation. You can see there's a lot of capability just directly you can use in this demo. Um, but I kind of wanted to show you what um, my perspective on it was and show you some different demos. Okay, you can see there's a lot of great stuff here within this slide deck. So I encourage you guys to check that out at html5rocks.com. Modernizer is a great tool for helping you do feature detection. So if you want to actually find out what the browser is capable of, you can use Modernizer to test the browser. Uh, another good source is dive into html5.org. There's a whole book out there for HTML5. You know, I've kind of read through all of that, and it's very interesting, and it'll also help you get up to speed. Uh, some other ones that I find that are interesting are some great demos, like Chrome Exper Experience Experiments, sorry, and then uh, 48 Excellent HTML5 Demos. They're kind of fun. You saw some examples like the Space Invaders one, etc. Uh, but there's one link here I just noticed and read through the last couple days. This is kind of a person who's basically saying, well, you know, this HTML5 thing, it's not really ready for a lot of mobile application 
uh, development. So there are some folks out there saying, you know, HTML5 cannot replace Objective-C. And I wholly agree with that sentiment. You're not going to replace Objective-C, and you're not going to replace Android Java with HTML5. But for those of us who have been Java developers on the server side for all these years and been web developers for all these years, Divs gives us a way to actually play on the client side, specifically in a mobile context. And we showed you examples of Bank of America and Verizon, et cetera, and as well as the demos we did here in the session. Hopefully that at least inspires you to believe that you can actually do this yourself and try some of this for yourself. But I encourage you to check out his, um, his posting there because uh, I think he does a great job breaking it all down, how you would build an HTML5 application, and what the limitations and, and roadblocks are for full adoption of that HTML5 capability. So let's, um, let's see if we have some questions. Jay and Wes, I know you guys have been looking at the questions. What kind of questions might you guys have out there for us? Or anything that's interesting that you've seen so far? Jay, we Jay and Wes may be on mute. Okay, good question. The, um, it depends on which demo you're talking about here. And so let me, I actually did for, yeah, for the mobile booking one, or I do have it out there at GitHub. So here it is. So I actually, for the mobile booking one that you saw, uh, that's with the scrollable user interface with the hotel listing. Uh, that one I did publish out there to GitHub. You can kind of see, you know, here's the hotel.html, which actually does the specific HTML file. You can see it uses JSON, hit the RESTful endpoint for hotels, and then it actually does a um, specifically pushing out that in individual pieces of data out into this form here. All right, so you can get it all on GitHub for that one. As far as the WebSocket one, uh, that is not on GitHub. I can push it out there if people want to uh, email me or something. I can show you how to set that up. That actually requires some server-side configuration, some firewall configuration to make the WebSockets work, uh, to let those messages flow through the broker and out to the client, um, so we can we can certainly get that to you guys if you want as well. So good question. Jay, anything else you noticed or any comment that you might have based on what you heard, saw or heard or how what people have chatted with you or QA'd with you during the session? Yeah, I think that's um, a good point. Not specific to uh, mobile. That was a question that just also came up. Right. It's, uh, it's rich enough to support any, any type of, uh, of application. I think that's important to note. I, what I see is in the industry right now, for all of us who've been doing desktop browser applications for such a long time, the HTML5 also changes the game for desktop applications. So using Modernizer to verify what kind of features you have on that desktop browser for building a... Uh, a desktop browser that works offline, works with direct push, you know, that kind of stuff would be, would be very interesting, very useful. Any other questions that you guys might have and, and interest in shooting us? And I can also exit the desktop share here. I just left it up so you guys can continue to see, uh, you know, what, in case there's something else we want to look at while we're here. Now that is an interesting one. I haven't thought about that one in a while. The um, as far as HTML5, keep in mind that HTML5 is just HTML. So anything you would use historically for HTML, uh, like like a Dreamweaver is a good example. It has different HTML5 capability support for it today. And then even Eclipse has some extensions to support more HTML5 capability. But I'm not aware of any specific great IDE for any kind of HTML JavaScript kind of development. Uh, Jay, can you think of any?
Okay, that, and I guess that's a good point. I mean, I have it running here. This is JBoss Tools within Eclipse. And, uh, you know, you can see it's pretty straightforward. There's JavaScript in here. Uh, but the one couple gotchas I'll just point out, since we have everybody here on the line, is there are some things like it doesn't like the minify jQuery file. It puts a red X on it. Um, that's a, an Eclipse bug. You can just use the non-minified version. Um, so some of your JavaScript libraries that you'll import will just do things like this, you know, give you a red X when, in fact, there's nothing wrong with it. Works fine, at least from a browser standpoint. But otherwise, I certainly have done all my development for these little demos that you saw for me in the context of Eclipse uh, specifically.